Good evening, everybody. My name's Linda Stewart. I'm the chair of the Burwood Texas Community Board, and uh, I'm here to facilitate this meeting tonight, and we've got a lot to get through, and we're going to have to make do. Um, please don't breathe in too much, because I think someone will fall off their chair. This, uh, we'll just have to make do. Now, um, we, we've, we did arrange to have booze ready, at the end of the meeting, but three of them have been uh, set up over at the staff room, and we'll let you know at the end of the meeting that you can go over there. You just need to let the speakers have a chance to get there before you. I'd like to introduce your speakers. We have Roger Sutton. Big wave. <laughs> And we have Barry Searle from EQC. Where is he? Where's he gone? There he is. And we have John McSweeney from Southern Response. A special thanks for these people coming along tonight. And a special thanks to yourselves as well. The, the format for the night will will be the speakers that I've just introduced, which are Sarah, EQC and insurers. Then we'll have a 15 minute break for questions. And um, I'll let you know when we go into questions, that 15 minutes is pretty precious. So we'd like to use it as economically as possible. Then we'll have another presentation, which is for uh, Department of Building and Housing and City Council. That will be followed by another set of around about 30 minutes questions and then we'll break out for those booths if you'd like to go. Now one of the things I'd like you to try and do is keep your questions um, hypothetical rather than your own personal situation because the booths have been set up specifically for your individual questions. You behave yourself. <coughs> we don't need this. We've got a lot of work to get through. Well, I used to push it all the time. Moving on, I'd like to introduce Peter Beck. He's down there. Would you like to give us a wave, Peter? And I think Tim Baker's here somewhere. There's Peter. Tim, sorry. Uh, he's our Deputy Chair of the Community Board. And then also we have uh, our Avondale Residents Association, I think, Adrienne, could you stand up? She's down. If I could just find her. <laughs> if there's room. Oh, she's way down the back there. And we have Cheryl and Lois. And Colin is here somewhere. You got your hand up somewhere, Colin? This, this group of people have been fantastic. They came out of recess because really there weren't any issues for Avondale until we had the earthquakes. And, you know, they had the same issues as you. They had broken roads, um, liquefaction up to here, and the same issues that everyone else had, and they've been fantastic. And uh, at, at the end of, of the presentation, there'll be a booth for them as well. We call them the neighbourhood group. I think it's really friendly. And I think um, I absolutely admire them for their work. Sorry if my voice goes, it's liquefaction. <laughs> Actually, it's dust. <laughs> uh, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Roger Sutton to do his presentation. Thanks. Well, welcome everybody. First of all, first of all apologies for the venue. Um, we've, we've, this is uh, the third session we've had, and the, all the other venues have been bigger. But for this area, this is the be biggest hall we could get, and we know this area's had a very difficult time, so we want to get to you early. But that means we're, we're in a venue which is, which is much smaller than we, than we, we should have had. So I, I apologise for those of you who are standing, but for those of you who get fed up with standing or it gets too hot, um, we have actually got people at the back who will tell you about where the next meeting is that you can actually get to. But I do apologise for this, but we, we also just weren't sure how many people would turn up as well, and I guess I wonder if we didn't have the beautiful moon out, if we'd had a... A rainy night, we would have had a lot fewer people here. Um, I guess, I guess, um, 
First of all, a lot of you have waited a long time for these sort of discussions. Um, you've also waited a long time to get your houses fixed. I know there's a huge amount of frustration out there. Um, everything we're doing is trying to speed things up. Um, and I know that sounds like hollow words for a lot of you, but things like the fact we actually did this land categorisation, that was, that's actually designed to try and speed up the overall rate of repairs around, around the city, including in these areas here. Can I just deal with that quickly to begin with? Is that OK? So, I mean, I think some people think by actually having a, a TC3 category, we've, slow, we've slowed things down. But the risk we were faced with immediately after the earthquake was that you know, a lot of areas around Christchurch had had quite a lot of land damage. There had been liquefaction in areas. And our fear was that unless we actually said, look, this is the area which, which is you know, the worst damaged land, then we'd, be, we'd have a whole lot of resources, drilling rigs, engineers, geotech specialists spread out across the city trying to work out what, what needed to happen before houses could be fixed, and we thought that would slow things down. So if you make up, if you said we had like a thousand people who could do that sort of work around Christchurch, if those thousand people were spread around 60,000 properties, that's going to be a longer recovery for everybody than those thousand people just working on the, the 25,000 properties in the TC3 area. So it's almost just like a, a thing at a hospital where you triage things that these are the areas that need that need, if you like, the most help and assistance to try and make sure they actually got they actually got the resources where we wanted them to go. The other thing we did in terms of the land categorization was having these different foundation designs. And I think we, we got those out in about April. And these are designs to make the foundations of houses on T three areas where you needed it stronger. And the idea was there, by having a standard design, we're trying to speed things up. If what we'd said was, look, if, you, if you've got a damaged foundation in a TC3 area, go to an engineer and he'll design you the right foundation, then the engineer would have taken a week to design it, another week for someone to check it, and it would have cost this much money, it would have taken a lot longer. What we've tried doing is having standardising things so things can go more quickly. And I think there's probably no one in this room who's actually got their foundation fixed on their house yet. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there are, we are starting to see insurers are starting to do full rebuilds in TC3 areas. But it's much slower than I would have liked, and I know it's, it's hurting a lot of you really badly. The sort of statements I've been making lately, um, which I think people are starting to listen to, is that we can't have you know, another winter where, in particular, the elderly and people with health issues go through another winter feeling they're in a, a badly broken house that they can't see any, any hope in where it's, where it's going to get done. Um, we have seen some statements coming out even in the last week or so from some of the insurers saying they, they're, they're going to come out with time frames for everybody by the end of September. Some of the other insurers are saying they want to see all the vulnerable people's houses fixed first and they're going to come out with those sort of time frames. But that also won't make it all of you happy because for some of you, you're not. You don't won't fit into you might be vulnerable, but you don't fit into one of those classic vulnerable categories. So you're still gonna feel, you know, quite quite frustrated. But the overall drive we've had, if you like, at Sarah and at the government was to try and do a package that meant people could rebuild their houses on T three areas as quickly as possible and be insured going forward, and also have confidence that if there is another earthquake, which there isn't going to be <laughs> that your house would actually survive it. What we need is a tsunami. So, yeah, well... Um, so that's really been... So, I mean, and, and I guess in terms of... There's a lot of frustration with the insurance industry. But in a lot of places in the world, they actually haven't had any earthquake insurance because, one thing, the insurers haven't been reassured about the building standards houses are built at, so they don't know whether to offer insurance or not. Well, one of our focuses has been to try and make sure the insurers and these reinsurers, who are really the ones who have paid out, paying out most of the money, when they look at New Zealand and go, well, we really are a first world country, we've got good foundation designs and big, good building standards, and therefore we can insure you going forward. So we're a bit afraid about the whole thing about having, if you like, a rip, shit and bust, get out there and fix houses as quickly as you can. They do an average sort of job without good quality designs, that we could look these big reinsurers, fancy engineers in the eye and say, well, actually, this is designed to take almost any sort of quake we're likely to get going forward. Are you taking into fact variation 48, the fact that we're all in a flood zone? 
Yes. So that was that was so I, I will do I can do a little bit with the flooding later on, but yes we are. And I guess an overall concept there is, you know, we've been concerned about the flood stuff, I've been concerned about it. The overall concept there is, you know, a small number of people are gonna have some more exposure to flood risk, and I don't remember quite exactly what that number is, but it's quite a small percentage of that group where that's actually a significant increased risk. So some people might have this much more water, you know, on their road or in their garden. And some of them might have this much, but there's very few who are going to get a really significant large number of water, amount of water. That's because while the land has dropped, in general the waterways that take the water away, water away has dropped as well. So we're really conscious there's a lot of concern out there in the community about the flood stuff. And we want to communicate that to you in a form where as that, all that data is processed, you're given it, and we don't say, look, ma'am, you're OK, your PDP 1134 reading is 9.7 now, while it was 9.8 before. You know, that doesn't make any sense, does it? You know, we want to put it in a, in a, we want to, we want to present it in a format that people actually feel reassured and confident, rather than going, you know, you bunch of bloody idiots, I don't understand what this is, I now need to employ another engineer to interpret it. So I think that's really the, like the next round of information to come out is that flood stuff. So that's, can, can I, is that okay for to sort of introduce the topic? But I guess, I guess the other thing people worry about is I spend all my days worrying about a convention centre and stadium and those sort of things. Well, I'd be quite happy with the afters to go through what my diary is for the week, and I've, I'm not sure I've, ever, I've actually spent even five minutes this week on convention centres or stadiums. This is very much my focus, making sure we get this part of the rebuild really going. You know, half the, half, more than half the value of the damage in Christchurch is about... Is, is, is residential stuff. And I think for a lot, for most of you, you know, big stadiums and convention centres are all lovely, but you really have to get your feeling like you're going to get your life back together again. You want to feel you know when your house is going to be fixed. And you want confidence when it is going to be fixed, they're going to be safe almost whatever happens going next. So look, so there's, there's me, there's me, there's EQC, there's insurers, Department of Building and Housing, City Council people here, and I think we've sort of we've covered that, haven't we? Um, Is there any geotechs here tonight? Um, we have. We've got. We've got um, people here. Can generally talk about the the the, the geotech stuff as well? Yeah, yeah, we have. We have. So why is my land? So the key issues I was going to about. Why is my land in a technical category? What's happening to my claim? What am I? When am I going to get it fixed? What's the process? How do I move forward? So that's some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Do I need to talk about this stuff? Shall I explain the different roles just really quickly without bloody turning into a bloody lecture? Is that, does anybody want to hear this? Yeah. I'll do it really quickly then. So, we've, as you like, we're, I'm the guy with, if you like, I report to you know, Mr Brownlee, so I've got overall, if you like, responsibility for trying to make the recovery happen. Um, I can't make some people do things that I'd like to make them do, but I've got, if you like, I've got that overall accountability. Department of Building and Housing, they're the ones have worked with a whole bunch of smart engineers, um, smart building designers to think about how we build foundations that are stronger. And Malcolm is here to talk about that. EQC, I think we know who EQC are, we know who the insurers are. The council are the ones who fundamentally have the responsibility of the infrastructure, but they're also the ones who do the flooding stuff, they're the ones doing that modelling, but they're also the guys who do the building consents. And I think sometimes some of you get irritated by the building inspector who fluffs around and craps about and talking about X, Y, Z detail. Is that fair to say? Well, the building inspector is your friend. He really is your friend because if an insurer or someone else wants to repair a foundation using some technique which you think is dodgy, for want of a different expression, the building inspector is a guy who will have to sign off on it and say that it's not dodgy. So you actually want the building inspector, you want to buy, make him muffins and cups of tea when he comes around, because you really want him actually being really thoughtful about what's happening here is actually working. When your foundation is fixed, is he fixed it to the right standard? So sometimes we feel animosity towards those people. I'd say there's no, don't feel any animosity. I, I, would, I would plead with you. I really want to try sneezing to see how they do the sneeze, but I won't. <laughs> uh, chew. Ah, <laughs> uh, chew. <laughs> um, 
So look, maybe I'll talk about the, the land categorization stuff. Should I start there? So the first thing was, and some of you probably appealed to go read. Is that some of you appealed to go read? Yes. So, I mean, the red zoning was about people whose land couldn't be fixed on an individual basis. So um, in, in, May, in the main, that was where the land, um, the crust had got thin, or there was so much lateral spreading, you're going to have to build some sort of a wall to stop your land moving towards the river or the culvert or whatever, or the crust was so thin it was going to be very difficult to build a house on it. So that was the, that was the most important test we applied. So we think, we, we, we think we, and the, on the boundaries of where those drill lines were, more geotech drilling was done to understand the crust thickness and those sort of things. So there was actually a lot of work that was done over a long period of time to do that, to do that, um, to do that land categorisation. And that's also why it took a long time and we had a lot of really pissed off people at the end because we wanted to try and work out where those, where those boundaries were. What about if you have your land built a metre up before they pass a conceit for a permit? So, I mean, I've talked about it that at length with, if you like, the engineering experts who've designed these foundations. And I've talked about places like where they say, you know, some people say you need to build your land up. I'm not aware of places where you do need to build your land up. Like I mean. one. Okay, well, let's, we talk about Africa. So, yeah. me talking to the experts tells me even places really close to rivers, they think there are foundation designs that will work in those places and the places we've turned green. That's, that's the advice we've had. In general, when we weren't sure whether to turn things red, when we had doubt, places were going red. If we're in doubt, we were doing that because we wanted to make sure we're doing it on a conservative basis so that engineers would be able to design these foundations and you were insurable going forward. How did people go into the red zone and they hardly had any lateral factors in their homes? And how did you come to that conclusion? So the, the, it was about, it was about the, the, the decision about the red zoning was almost much more about your susceptibility to further damage than the damage you'd actually had. So for example, there are some people in Kaiapoi tonight, we have a meeting there, they get, they're really angry because they're still red and they want to be green because their land damage isn't that great. But the characteristics of their land is we think it's really hard to build a house on it in the future without it being seriously damaged. So it really comes back down to that insurability. So, what, so the test about what land damage you've got was part of the equation, but the real damage, the real test the question we asked ourselves, and the engineers were asking themselves, can you build a house on that safely in the future? Will an engineer be able to design a foundation, and will the insurer be confident about that foundation design that will insure it going forward? And that was, that, was, that was fundamentally the test. So there are some areas where that doesn't look fair. There are also some areas where we felt that they were so exposed to flooding, it was going to be really hard. And some of the areas around Brooklands and those sort of places. So Brooklands, for example, is an area where it doesn't look all that damaged in some areas but they've got a lot of flooding risk there. And that flooding risk we thought was going to be almost impossible to mitigate, and that flooding risk meant that it was going to be very hard for them to get insurance and that sort of stuff. How come the red zone can go down the river street, turn a sharp right angle with a sighted major red paddle, and carry on down, and you see if you're on one side or red on the other? I think it was all done by guesswork. So, I mean, so, I mean the, 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 you know, a lot of you have appealed. Did you appeal, sir? So, I mean, so the appeal process was run by a guy called Keith Turner, who's, um, you know, he's run a lot of big engineering stuff. He's done, he's got himself in trouble with big geotech problems before. He's the guy who started build, trying to build Project Aqua before he had all the, you know, he's, he, he's a guy who's worked a lot with geotech information. <laughs> and he's, he oversaw that process and he did time out in the field. He went through all that, all that data that was collected by the engineers and he did a lot of testing of it. And that's why about 100 places went red at the, at the end of that process. So but it was I'm, an Avondale. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, for many people, they would have liked a lot more. Um, but I guess, you know, I wasn't, I'm not Keith Turner, and I, I wasn't telling Keith what to do. But I thought, we thought it was important. There was actually an independent process about, about, what, about what happened. But not everybody, you know, some people in the green, in the, in the red zone wanted to go green. So not everybody wants to go, wants to go, wants to go red. Um, do I talk more about the red zone stuff, or are you sort of over that? <laughs> well, well, I'll just say really, re really quickly. I mean, the other thing was, in general, for the red zone stuff, to fix the <coughs> land so you could have built on it again, you're going to have to build it up and then build really big walls to stop the land for the lateral spread. So lateral spread's this thing, which we all know now. You know, here's your land, and it shakes, and then it just slides towards the river. 
And the thing is, these walls to stop your land is sliding towards the river. In some cases, we're going to have to be sort of 10 metres deep and 10 metres wide made out of stone. So that was really difficult, difficult stuff to do. So that would have taken time, so it was how long that would have taken. So a lot of you are feeling frustrated about how long it's going to take you to get your house back, but on the red zone, we figured it was going to take us like four or five years before people would have been able to get on, would have been able to fix their infrastructure, would have been able to fix their houses. There was also the stuff on the red zone. In general, the infrastructure was very, very badly broken. A lot of you have got badly broken infrastructure, but the red zone was often much, much worse. And being the former Orion guy, you know, I've seen the maps of where all the really bad cable breaks were and mapped on top of the red zone. There's a very, very strong correlation. Um, the infrastructure stuff, a lot of you are struggling with infrastructure you think is pretty average at the moment, roads that are broken, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, an overall concept there is that they want to try and understand what's happening in the pipes under the ground so they know where to dig rather than just digging everything up and then fixing pipes that are perfectly good. So some of the frustration there is they want to do that, those thorough investigations about the state of the pipes before they dig up the roads and make a bloody great mess. And in many ways, because they know they've got to fix a lot of the pipes, a lot of the electricity stuff under the roads, fixing the actual roads in many cases is going to be, the big fix is going to be last because they don't want to be digging up the roads more than, more, more than once. But I think we are seeing a lot more of those, a lot more roadworks out here now than we did, say, three or four months ago. Can I say that? I think that I think that's a really fair question. I think we need to work 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 more closely with communities, working out what are those little easy things to do, filling the potholes, fixing the footpaths, you know, on the way to the local park where people push their prams and that sort of stuff. I think there's a there's, we, we should be much closer to communities working out what we can do there. And I I think that's a really fair point. Well, well, look, I'm I'm the bloody biker, so I find that you know. <laughs> Those buddy potholes, I do a lot of swearing and bickering. I don't ride my road, but I don't ride my road bike very much any longer. Certainly not at night, because you can buddy disappear into them. Literal spreading is such an issue. How can you get such a fine line on your return? Well, I guess at the end of the day, there had to be a line. There had to be a line, and for some people, they're on the wrong side of that line. But there had to be a line. <laughs> Fit, well. Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald Ave is actually an example where they're fixing the lateral spread there with, that, with, the, with the work. That's actually an example of, um, of fixing lateral spread. And in fact, the lateral spread they're fixing there won't be fixed to the degree we think you need to fix it to build houses. It's going to be strong enough for a row, but not actually strong enough for a house. So look, so then there's the green zone. There's about 180,000 180, properties. Um, we think there the land damage can be repaired on an individual basis. There may be some people on land which is so badly damaged, but it's going to be a really small number where EQC may put them through their price say, well, actually, you're so badly damaged, we're going to pay you out. But we think it's a very, very small number. It might be a dozen, some number like that. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a really big number. But on the Port Hills, there'll be more of those, and I don't think any of you are from the Port Hills, where there's been things like cliff claps and those sorts of ugly, ugly things as well. But the point is, the red zone, you can't, you can't fix houses on the red zone, you can't, without actually fixing the land, and you have to do that on a group basis. And our view is on the green land, you can do it on an individual basis. Can you explain how? Yeah. Um, so, well, I mean, it depends on the type of land damage you've got. I mean, in many cases, you won't actually have to do that much repair of the land before you can fix your house. The idea of these new foundation designs is that they are actually strong enough that you don't actually have to raise the land to be able to fix your house. That's really the idea of them. So they're going to raise the house so you don't get flooded. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we think, I really think to say again, we really think the flooding issue actually is going to be, isn't going to be that great. I mean, one of the things about Christchurch, I don't want to treat you like idiots, but Christchurch is flat. So when we get three inches of rain, basically we get three inches more water on the ground until it drains away. Well, you're from Greymouth, you get three inches of rain in the hills behind you, you do actually get to fill up a river that floods everything. We're not literally getting flooding by rivers here, we're getting flooded by, by local stuff. So when it rains more, it is actually spreading out, so it, the issue isn't as bad as we get in other places. But I've been, I was really concerned about the flooding stuff for a lot of people. But that... Yeah, no, that's right. So in some areas, in some areas we... No, you're actually right, sir. In some areas... Things like the stormwater stuff does need to be fixed before some of that water is going to work, and there's a lot of that. There's going to have to be some more work done on that. But in overall sense, it's not nearly as serious as we thought it was going to be. But I mean, I've seen. You know, I live in an area around Beckham in that area, 
And we also had a lot of surface water around, and I saw that water coming out of drains too. Yeah. Mm. So look, this is just a map of the liquefaction we saw in um, September. And, um, and in fact, there's a reasonably good correlation with the red zone. There's a reasonable correlation from, from, from that su 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 September quake. There's Hagley Park down there. Here's the river out here, and we're sort of down in this area here mainly living. Is that fair to say for most of you? Um, you know, it's a bit, of, a bit of this around at South Shore with some that, some back sleep. There was quite a lot of liquefaction. But then if you go, if you go to um, February, it was pretty ugly. And that's what I say about the technical categories. That, you know, we had land damage and liquefaction of a big area of Christchurch. So if we just said to, if we hadn't had these technical categories, and this is an area where we need to do more investigation before we rebuild a house, they would have been doing really detailed land investigations pretty much all over the city. And those thousand people or whatever the number is would have been spread really thinly. And we think that would have slowed down the overall recovery. We don't want someone drilling holes on land which is TC2 and doing detailed geotech investigation. It's a waste of time. We want them doing it where they're going to achieve the most good. Because see, there's a, a big area that had um, liquefaction, and for most of you, you would have had liquefaction in your streets. And it was pretty bloody grim. And it's right in the sections and your streets and your houses, you've had, you've, had a, you've had a hell of a lot of it. Yeah. Do you want it back? Well, I think I'm, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, an issue for us is just if like the scale of all this as well, that you know, in the red zone, also the houses, we did look at the damage to the houses in the red zone. And in some areas of the red zone, like 80% of the houses were complete write-offs. Um, and those ratios just weren't nearly as bad in a lot of those TC3 areas. So we were then going to end up, yeah, look, do you want me to, I can crap on all day about that stuff, but I'll keep moving. Mm. So there's, there's, um, there's the red zone there, there's the colours. Does that, can you see those colours there? So I mean you can see there there's some correlation between you know, your blue areas and the look. oh bugger, sorry, apologies. <laughs> but you can see there's a lot of areas with liquefaction there that aren't TC, TC3. And that was the thing, we wanted to try and do what I'd call that triaging thing. We've got the nurse at the hospital working out where people have to go. And you can see the red zones there, and you've got some red zones on the port hills, and there's still some white zone areas on the port hills. And if I want to go to a really fiery public meeting, I go, the people are still in the white zone, because they're pretty bloody upset. Um, but you can see there, there's all these areas, this, this TC1 area out here. Out here. I mean, an issue that one thing people have been asking me, just, can I, do you want to hear about land value stuff? I mean, one, yeah. thi one, one thing I've been trying to understand about land value stuff, so one question people ask me, well, if I wanted to move away, am I going to pay a fortune for new land out, out west? So I had a bunch of all the valuers in my office, well, not an offer, you know, at a meeting the other day, talking to them about TC3 issues, trying to hear from them how we can work with them so, they're, you know, so they can do a better job on, on that sort of land. And I asked them how much they thought land sort of out here had gone up by and they thought the overall cop value of that land had gone up by roughly about 10%. So that wasn't as much as what I thought. And I said, well, do you think they're making super profits, those people? And I thought, well, they maybe are making more money, but overall they thought the civil contractors, the guys building the roads, digging, that sort of, they thought the costs were up by about 25%. So that was just, you know, a benchmark. But <coughs> Well, I mean, so one of my colleagues, a guy who actually looks after insurance issues at my, at my place, he went off to try, he's moved down from one, he went off to buy a TC3 house the other day. He'd got a valuation, he was ready to bid on it, and the, it went for much more than his valuation, went for much more than RV. So there is, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess, so one thing why we're getting people like the valuers and to talk to them and those sort of people is we want to understand how we can give them information um, to reassure them about this land is actually, is actually good land, it is actually okay it's to rebuild it. It's not the valuers that's the, the problem, it's, Trying to get, I mean, I sell real estate yeah. around and specialise yeah. in the area. It's the banks so, who try and get a loan, they require 70% deposit, not 10% elsewhere. Yeah. It seems trying to, I had one property, the vendors, so, they could get, the purchasers could get house insurance, but they couldn't get contents insurance. So at the moment, so at the moment, um, so at the moment we've had, we've had, se we've had sessions with the values, with real estate mm -hmm. agents. Um, we, we did one with, we've done one with the bankers as well. Um, and what the bankers are saying is it just depends a lot on the property. 
So in some cases on TC3 land, the ratio almost to go to normal lending, complete, you know, what I call normal lending ratios, if the house is a light house. So it just depends on the particular people's circumstances. And one of the things we're trying to do is trying to work with those institutions so they get more confidence. It's get the more information. That need the confidence. Oh no! So I guess so I guess our thing is also to try and work with all the all the people that talk to buyers to reassure them to give them good quality information, and that's the thing. It's just taking time to get that message out there. So as well as doing these sort of sessions, I'm having breakfast sessions from seven in the morning, talking to those sort of other professionals because they're the ones who spread the word to other people who are making those sort of decisions. The, the may there may be a correlation in general it's about it's about the engineer's view about how what how strong a foundation you're going to need no, so, but I'm talking about land the 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 may, the may the may be a correlation there um, i don't I, I i don't know enough but it won't be a perfect correlation as well can we leave a question yeah sure what can we should, should we leave the questions can we, can we try and leave the questions to the end and then we're going to have superficial people running around with the microphones because otherwise we get this frustration okay so this is your, can I call it, you know, it's just the general area. So there's pockets of TC3 there, there's pockets of red as well. Um, so we've got these three, three, three technical categories. Um, and what we're saying is the technical category three is an area where, we, where the engineers, if you need a new foundation, need to do more investigations before they go and build you a new foundation. Um, so they need to do, get some drilling information either from your property or a property nearby, nearby. And in some cases, in many cases, you won't need a TC3 foundation. You'll need that other, a, a Category 2 foundation. So one of my other colleagues at work, he's, he paid for his own drilling to happen because he got so fed up. And he found that he doesn't actually need a TC3 foundation. He's only a TC2 foundation. So in general, we've tried we've tried to give people confidence to try and if and doubt get you know get it drilled and then work out what you need what you need to drill. So twenty meters of sure. sand and you'll still build a new house on top of that. So what we're, we're going to try and take the questions at the end if we can. So you answer what? Answer that question now. You answer it bloody now, mate. Well, I'm really happy to answer it now. <laughs> Well, I'm happy. Well, what, let's be quiet. So, so what we're going to do is, so what we're going to do is that we're going to have someone at the front here who's going to write down the questions and where they, what they are. But if we can hold them till the end, I think it's much easier for everybody else in the room to have them. We've done a lot of community meetings, and in general, they work best when we have the questions at the end. And Roger, too, the question to that is coming up in slides. Yeah, that's right. How do you know? Because you said it the quick presentation. We've done this presentation before, so we've had the land. We've had the land zoning review. I've talked a bit about that. Um, if you want to know more about that land zoning, that's up on our website. Um, and also, if you want to get more information, understand more about that, you can also ring that 0800 ring Sarah. Um, and I'm around after the meeting, and there's other Sarah people around after the meeting to take to take your questions. Um, Am I up to, should I hand over to the insurer, should I carry on here? No, I reckon you carry on. Okay. So look, so the insurers, so there's a lot of work going on at the moment. To, for, so how many of you know that you're actually directly over cap? How many of you still sort of feel in, in no man's land, you don't know if you're over cap or not? Well, I know I'm over cap. So, I don't know where the fuck I am. I think that's true. So... There's a lot of work, so there's a lot of work going on by different insurance companies to try and get through and work out where people are who are on the boundary. And that's been incredibly frustrating for a lot of people. Um, EQC, I hope I'm not going to get beaten up by EQC. EQC are now working with some of the saying, look, if it's on the boundary, well actually we'll just we can do an on-site on-site discussion, or if necessary, we can actually just hand the claim over to you if it's over a certain with some insurers. Is that okay, Brian? Yeah, I'll talk about that. Yeah. So we're going to talk more about that. There's an area-wide drilling program. Maybe I'd best to leave Brian to talk about that. But that area-wide drilling program, we're trying to do a drilling program where EQC are trying to run, which is as efficient as possible. Okay. We're trying to get it done, if you like, rather than doing every single house sort of as a do this house and this house, come back to this house, doing it in a much more systematic way. So we're not actually going back 
back upon ourselves. We're doing it in a way that we collect the information as fast as we can. So look, like, should, should we take should we take people want to take some should we take some questions now? People want to give questions to me. We've got some microphones here ready to go. So the woman here had the question first of all. So pass the microphone to Angela. So what we're going to do is, if you stick your hand up, how many microphones have we got? We've only got one. If you stick your hand up, and then I'm answering the question, Angela will bring the microphone to the next person she sees. Ma'am. Drilling has just been taken place outside my Avondale Road property. 19.95 metres of sand. I have a sample of it in a jar at home. Will you build a new house on top of that? So, I mean, I think we'll get Malcolm from the Department of Building Housing. He's going to come to those sort of issues. He, we, we, he's going to talk about that. Where are we going now, Angela? So, yeah. Hello, welcome. Yes, you said to keep the uh, just, just, just talk into the microphone, ma'am. You, you said to keep this, the questions hypothetical. Now, I've got a question about the house that's got half a metre of uh, liquefaction underneath, there's six inches of water on the top after this flooding, and the garage, which went 40 kilometres down at the back, and my 80-year-old husband works in there all day, and there's water still there. I've talked to you before, Mr. Sutton, on the wireless. Um, the water is still in the garage from the, the several weeks ago. Now, who is in charge? I applied, I got two marvellous, lovely people there. Uh, we got Ross from Mainland Claims here. He came straight out. The man came from uh, Lumley Insurance. Yeah. Straight away they came yeah. and they said that would have to be addressed under the floor. And I rang EQC, they yeah. said put a claim in. They've, re they've rejected it. Uh, Barry Searle rang me, whoever he is, he's uh, one of the other. Once. Yep. And I told him there was no way my husband was going to spend the rest of his life in a garage with flooding, yeah. stinking water. Yeah. And he said, you'll go back to your insurance. I said, he said, oh, at your age, we'll get you much too. I said, don't even think about it. Mm. Because yeah. there's no way we're going to be pushed through. Who's in charge? You or who? So Who's in, in charge of the yes, flooding fine. or whatever? So in terms of, I mean... So, I mean, I'm, I'm in charge. I, I have overall responsibility for trying to make sure the recovery happens. But in terms of getting your individual house fixed, I'm not in charge. And I actually don't have any powers to beat up the insurance companies, drag them down, say, you must... So, can I, can I try and finish answering? I'll try answering the, the, the question. What, we are, what you are saying is public pressure is coming on the people that are going to have to fix your house, like the insurers, to make sure they do fix it in a timely way. So EQC have committed, let me finish please ma'am, if you, EQ, EQC have committed saying that for people with more than $50,000 worth of damage, if it sounds like you have got that, they've said they want to get all those people done by the end of next year. And then for the insurers, I'm not sure whether Mr Lumley is making these statements, but for some of the insurers they're also saying for people in your sort of circumstances, they want to make your first in the queue. So what I can do is try and get the public discussion going so the insurers hear the feedback from the public, and then start bringing your sort of case forward because it's not acceptable that your husband has another winter operating in those sort of conditions. You told me that we're going to do anything about it. We had a joint review with EQC and the, the uh, lovely, and they said they weren't going to do anything about the garage, uh, 40 millimetres. Yes. Yeah, uh, so they said, no, it's, it's now within the new guidelines, if you like. Okay. And this all happened... Last year, well before the new guidelines came out. Okay. Right. All right. And you know, there's something badly wrong here. I really yeah, I mean, Simon, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, if you, if you, Simon, so, what we can do if you think your insurance company is ripping you no, off? Well, up, up here, lovely, have been, they've been disputing right. with EQC from day one. For okay. Us. Well, you, well, there's, look, there's a senior person here from EQC, and I said, what you do is you talk to them afterwards, and I'll make sure you meet <laughs> that person. Okay. All right. EQC Should we, can we move on to the next question? Because it's. Right. Okay. Ma'am, over here. Last year I wrote to uh, Mr. Simpson and didn't get a reply. What are you doing with the EQC? David, by your mouth. Oh, thank you. I see from the letter I got yesterday, though, which says. Can everybody hear the question now? No. So you, you, need, you need to speak more into the microphone. Put it right Steve. by your mouth, David. The question is why. Have you only got 12 rigs for 15 Okay. So, so, so we've still got EQC to go. So, leave that for EQC. Okay. 
Yeah, can we leave that for for Brian? Can we leave that from EQC? So I can we deal with the stuff that I've really directly dealt with? So we've got Brian. Brian from EQC is going to talk, and we're going to you know he he's here. We've also got a geotech person, right? I just have a question about the water, like the lady here. We're in the last category. No one wants to know us because we're under fifty. And when will we be looked at too? Because they're all saying we've got all these categories, but we're in the last one, and we're not going to be sent in last. But in the meantime, we're cleaning out our garage every time it rains because of all the water. The back section you can't walk anywhere. Right. Is there a time frame of when this is actually going to be looked at for the younger ones? So I mean, I think EQC is saying they want to they want to fix the worst damage first, and I think in general people think that's fair, but. That doesn't mean, that means for a lot of people like you who don't have a significant damage, you're going to be further down the queue, and I know that's just really frustrating. Um, my question is in a few years' time, when the red zone gets rebuilt on and we're left with our lovely TC3 land, are we going to be lower than them? Are we going to be, like, what, what's going to happen? To so, us so, 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 in general, the, t the, um, the red zone land is actually the land which is actually much more exposed to flooding. So which is one reason why it was good that it went red. Um, I'd be really surprised if that red zone land got rebuilt on in 10, 20 years. I'd be just really surprised. I'd, I'd be very surprised if it ended up in anything other than parkland. But we can't, we can't, we haven't made any decisions on that. And in terms of the way the EQC's reinsurances who insured the land, if we say it's going to become a park, it starts affecting the sort of insurance payouts we're going to get from the reinsurers. But our expectation is it's going to become parkland and some of those areas may also help us mitigate um, localised flooding risks as well because it becomes sinkholes and those sort of things. So it's, it's important we do that sort of stuff, we do that stuff really well. But there's a lot of stuff we're doing in the red zone with those communities because there's a lot of frustration with those people too. Sir? Roger, I want to ask you a question. You've been going on about the, um, the foundations and the different categories that um, our Department of Building and Housing have put in as far as foundations are concerned. The question that I've got for you is, why do they revise the guidelines on levels of foundations? I defy any builder that would build a house 50 millimetres out of level over 10 metres, yet the Department of Building and Housing guidelines, which EQC seem to want to adopt, is if your house is under 50 millimetres over the floor plan, then they're not going to fix it. So, so what happened was the Department of Building and Housing um, went around and started doing some surveys of houses around other parts of New Zealand to find out what sort of levels existed in other places. And they found a large percentage of houses actually were worse than that, that were worse than that level. So worse than that 50 millimetres, 50 millimetres over 10 metres, is that the number? That's correct. They found they were worse than that. They found Jerry Brownlee's office in the Beehive was worse than that, was worse than that level. So, what, 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 so I'm just saying, well they did, I'm just saying. I would absolutely dispute that. Well, if you've been to Jerry Brownlee, I was actually... Well, Jerry Brownlee, we know the weight of Jerry Brownlee, so if anyone outside I would, but, but that, that is actually the background, that actually the, the, the floor levels they'd found were in many places throughout New Zealand were actually already worse than that without an earthquake. That was, that was the background. Because, well, the, the, the guidelines, no one had ever really looked at the guidelines in that light. They'd never actually gone out and said, so yeah. The point is, they would have flat before that. Before mm. Yeah, I, I, I guess with suspicion, a lot of them weren't flat. But I, I, I hear your point, but that's actually what happened. There was so much feedback from around the country looking at flat floors that were actually already worse than that. Sir, is that at the back there? Ma'am. Sorry, ma'am. So, so can I let Brian, Brian who's going to talk about the, the, the overall drilling program, but it's not, it's, not two or, it's not two or three years to wait, and overall the drilling program in general is starting in the east and going west, and we're in the east. So at the moment, it's the moment EQC are drilling in a drilling pattern, which is for both, which is pretty dense, Brian. But look, can I leave Brian to talk about that rather than me selling his thunder? Right, so let me ask you a question. Why is it so, I know it's a vast, vast problem in the whole project, but are we so short of geotech engineers? Is it the, is it the drilling gear? Are we short of engineers? Why can't all be brought in? So we'll let, we'll, 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 we'll let Brian, welcome Brian. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll... 
I'll try and answer some of those as part of the presentation. Um, my name is Brian Dunn. Bruce Enson would be here to talk to you. He runs the operations uh, part of EQC in Christchurch. He can't be here tonight. Um, I run the government part of, of EQC. So Roger reports to Mr. Brownlee. I report to Mr. Brownlee. Brownlee kicks Roger. Roger kicks me. And sometimes he cuts out the middleman and kicks me directly. So um, that's the chain of command for us. What I want to do is talk to you tonight about, I guess I'd better start with, is there anybody out there who doesn't have a problem with EQC at the moment? <laughs> right. So I've got my audience, right? Okay. So I've got the right audience. What I want to talk about is some of the drilling issues, some of the other stuff that you've heard, which sounds a little bit like witchcraft, which is apportionment and settlement. Talk about some of that. Absolutely happy. There's a couple of questions I didn't quite hear when I was sitting down there about the foundations and so forth. I'm hoping I'll be able to answer some of those for you as well. We've got some EQC people here, we've got some geotechs here as well, so hopefully if I can't answer the question, I can draw on them to help answer your question as well. I'm absolutely happy and expecting to be here for a long time tonight while you guys give me your claims and your problems with your claims. I'm absolutely happy to hear that as well. Okay, uh, where are we going here, Roger? Right. Well, I just talked a little bit about uh, TC3, and I think uh, one of the key points that I want to put across is that TC3 doesn't necessarily mean that every house is going to be drilled. We're drilling where uh, foundation damage um, and foundation replacement is going to be required. So when we're looking across TC3, and these are sort of reasonably rough estimates, it looks like about a third don't have foundation damage. They can be repaired without drilling. Now, in Avondale alone, we've got 1,680 repairs underway, and we've completed 875. Okay, so we are repairing in TC3, and we are repairing right here. About a third of the houses, roughly, have foundation damage that is less than 25% of the foundation. Now, it's the city council, the consenting authority, that says, actually, if it's less than 25%, we think you can just get on and repair the foundations with what they had, and you don't require drilling. And then there's a third, it's probably slightly more than that, about 10, 10 and a half thousand properties. We're on the basis of inspections either by us or the insurer. We think there's foundation damage. And drilling will be required in order to inform the design of those foundations. Now, as Roger was trying to explain, and I, and I think he was doing a pretty good job, but you'll be the, the judge of that, what we're trying to do is optimise that drilling program. So as far as possible, if we can join with the insurers and drill on an area-wide basis, and interpret the information under that, it might mean that we don't need to drill every house. What does foundation mean? It's a very good question. If you look at my hands, you tell me, you tell straight away I'm not a builder. So foundation, where's a DBH? What's foundation? Um, I'll, I'll cover it off in my presentation. Is it a ring, or when you're talking the floor, you're saying 25%? John? Uh, we'll cover that off later. Okay. <laughs> well, should, we leave, should we leave it in the order we've got? Should we let Brian talk about that and then we'll talk about the actual real building issues with someone who's a real expert on that, which is Malcolm McMillan, who's right Yeah, here. sorry, I, I'm not an expert on that, so my apologies. Okay, I think the other point uh, that Roger touched on as well is, here's the TC3 timeline. You know this better than I do. Okay, so in June 2011, um, the green zone was established. Now, at that stage, everything was green, right? You remember that? Green was green. Okay. By October, we had TC categories. We had TC1 and TC2, and we had some guidance on what that might mean in terms of foundations. The repairs, the design, sort of, but what you could build your house on, basically. And that foundation guidance was released in December 2011. By March 2012, we sort of figured out, well, there's got to be something coming, so we started drilling. So we grabbed some rigs. I think we've got, Barry, correct me, I think 15 or 16 rigs that we grabbed in March and said, okay, this drilling thing's going to happen. Let's get them now before they head somewhere else. The rigs are, um, it's not so much getting the rigs, it's getting the people who know how to drive them is the issue. Somebody was asking before about resourcing. It's actually about the people who know how to drive them more than it is about pushing it in. <coughs> yep. And so we've, and that's right. And so we're looking overseas because we're looking overseas right now to try and get rigs. No, we've had since March this year. We had March this year where we started drilling in anticipation. 
Should we let Brian run his presentation and we can have okay. the questions? So in April, the TC3 Foundation guidance came out, and that was released by DBH. So our aim is to have um, a joint drilling program with the insurers. At the moment, they haven't signed up to it, but they're, they're indicating a willingness so that we can optimise these 18 or 16 rigs across the, the area. Um, and we are hoping and aiming to have all of the houses, regardless of the level of damage that EQC is dealing with, repaired by 2015, the end of 2015. We've made that commitment, Bruce has made that commitment publicly. The drilling program is taking a long time, I appreciate that, I know that. What are we... Yeah, well we are, we're looking overseas to get the rigs. There's, there's, not, there's not them here, so if they're not in New Zealand, we've got to look overseas and that's where we're looking. We've got to bring them in country, we've got to find the people to drive them, find the people to interpret it. So it's a resourcing issue. The rigs aren't sitting out in, in, in a, in a um, high equipped yard in Auckland waiting for someone. So what are we doing? We're trying to vol we are trying to prioritise the vulnerable. So the insurers and us are looking for uh, those residents who are vulnerable or who have special needs that mean that we need to drill there first. And that's what we're trying to prioritise. Now we're working with government agencies and sort of health, um, social welfare and others to try and identify those people, but you will know them. They will be your neighbours, they will be your family, they may well be you. So let us know, at the end of tonight, let us know if you know someone who's in the situation where they're looking as though it's completely over cap, a rebuild, absolutely and it needs to get going. They need to be at the top of the list for the drilling. John, I'm, I'm fairly sure that you support us on that? Yes, yes. absolutely. What happens to a property that uh, has been drilled and um, the foundation damage, the, the foundation repair has already been done. You've gone in and drilled that property. We've gone in and drilled a property where the foundation damage has already been done. That's correct. Yeah. Probably it's the area-wide thing is also thinking about where do you drill. It's not necessarily property specific. So do you remember this? Sorry, the question was what happens if we've repaired a property and we're drilling there now? Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. 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 So I've done foundation work three, four months ago. So it's all done, all repaired. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all repaired. Yeah. And your problem is. So the house is repaired. And, and the problem is you've got a drilling rig in your backyard. Good question. Tell me about the address afterwards and I'll, and I'll check it out. Prior to drilling, we'll ring you. I mean, we can't go onto your property without your permission, so you expect to get a phone call from us. You should also expect um, that we're going to take <coughs> photos of the property as we put the rigs on. If, if we can at all help it, we'll try and do it on the berm outside the property, but if we have to go onto the property, we're going to ring you and ask you if we can. If we ring you and ask you, even if we fix your house, um, please say yes, so we can actually get the drilling underway. Sorry? Okay, great. So please say yes. You'll probably see us take some photos. Why? Because we have to shift, I don't know, the, the kids' trampoline or something else in order to get the rig in the right spot, and it's not me who directs where the rig is, it's Geotech saying this is where we think we should be drilling to get the optimal, then we want to be able to put that back. Okay, so we don't want to be damaging your property putting a rig on there. So if we shifted some stuff, we're going to take some photos so we can put it back. We are drilling the most damaged areas first. That's where we've started. And we're trying to coordinate. You guys would have seen this, because I get it with my city council as well. They come and do the street, then they rip it up and do it again, then they rip it up and do it again. So we're trying to coordinate with SKIRT, and the guys doing the infrastructure rebuild, so that, one, we don't end up drilling something, drilling through a pipe that we didn't know was there, drilling a pipe that they've just replaced, or drilling where we're going to do some sort of underground you know, investigations only for them to come along later on and dig it all up again. So we want to try and coordinate with skirts so that they get benefit out of the drilling program as well. So that it makes sense, you know, in terms of the underground investigation that Roger was talking about before with the pipes. So it does mean someone is going to be last. Okay? You know that. Where are we? Okay, there's your answer. We've got 15 rigs. My apologies. On our website and on some of the posters here, you will see where we are 
where we have been and where we will be next in terms of the drilling. Okay? If you're looking at the where we will be next, that should tell you whether or not you should expect a phone call from someone saying, can we come onto your property? Okay? Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm Yep, I'll, I'll, I'll find you guys. Okay? I don't know where it is in, on the list here. At the end? Yep, boom. There. There. Avondale. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Okay, so someone's saying there's a rig in the next door neighbour's property, right? Yep. So there's drilling underway? Yeah, in Avondale? It's been and gone? Yeah. They were okay. in Hunt Lane yesterday doing, there's three being done in there. Okay, so we're not drilling for oil, just in case that rumour starts, and we're not doing any fracking either, okay? Okay, the point is there's not enough rigs, we're trying to get more, and the real, the real hen's teeth here are the guys and girls who know how to use them and interpret it, both driving the rigs, sorry, yep. 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 Okay, so the, sorry, thank you. The question that was asked was, uh, this lady's mother's house had quite a lot of liquefaction and it's been drilled next door. It hasn't been drilled on the one with liquefaction and it's been drilled next door. Okay. So you know how Roger was talking before about if we had all these engineers and they had to go all across Canterbury, it would be spreading out quite thin. What we're trying to do is instead of drilling every house, because that's going to take you think 18 months is long, you actually have to try and drill every house that requires you know, 10,500 houses. So we try and to optimise it so that we drill with the geotech, say actually if I can have a drill here, borehole here or CPT, do you know what CPTs and boreholes are? Yep. Yeah. Yeah? You guys are more informed than I am. So the CPTs as far as I know is like pushing a big cone into the ground to see how dense the ground is. And the borehole is about taking a big slug of soil out of the ground to see what the strata, what the different sort of levels of gravel, soils and sands, I think somebody else was talking about before, and sometimes water are. Okay, so, I lost my train of thought now on that. Uh, so, instead of trying to do every house, we're trying to get the geotechs to say, okay, if you drill here and here, and you get the same result, then actually that suggests underground it's the same thing. So if we can do it in a pattern that's broad enough, we can actually speed it up, and that's the whole idea. But between those two points, that texture can also change. Absolutely. When you've got a rig at one end of the street and then drilling down the other end, what happens in the middle? Absolutely. So I have to rely upon my geotechs to tell me whether or not that's the case. And they're also, I think they're using, where's, I think they're using underground sonar stuff as well to sort of see whether or not there's a change in the <coughs> likely for that situation, exactly the one that you've raised. So I have to, I have to be guided by guys who've got far more degrees than I do who tell me this is the best place to drill. Now some of that will mean in some cases we might have to come back and backfill. Come back and say actually yeah it looks like there's an aberration here the rig might come back. Yeah. Yeah so the question is also what happens if I'm on a back section? So it's five years out the front you've got a rig going down there but what about me up the back? Now I would and you would join the red zone. Right. So, Likewise. Yep. And I'd imagine if I can get a rig up there, and it's required to be there, so if the geotech says, yeah, we need to be drilling your property, we're going to try and get a rig up there. It might mean we're taking a photo of you and your neighbour's fences before we rip them down to try and get the rig up there to put them back. But I'm going to be guided by where they tell me is the best place to drill to optimise. It also means sometimes on a specific site case, they may well come back with a rig and try and drill there as well. Have we got? So I mean, I still I reckon, I still reckon Malcolm is the best guy to yeah. talk about that because Malcolm is, is the part of building and housing first. So there's been a lot of thought put into what's the closeness of that drilling pad. So you have the engineers enough confidence to build the foundations. So there's been a lot of thought by a lot of smart people. It's not just a couple of bureaucrats. If you want to call me a bureaucrat, it's actually been a bunch of engineers that brought in from around the country who are experts in the geotech stuff who are guiding that overall program. And we've got Mike Jacob, who's a geotech engineer here yeah. as well. Yeah, where's Mike? Yeah, so, so uh, an example of what that area-wide might look like, 
Um, have you seen the stage two report that was on our website <coughs> from about December 2010? We did some of the area-wide stuff. So that sort of gives you a pattern. I've got a slide that might show what it looks like next as well. Yep. This isn't about zoning, this is about foundation design. Yeah, and I've got nothing. Okay, so two questions. One from the back is, okay, uh, when the drilling's done, does it mean there might be a change in zoning? Is that a fair summary? Sure. Shall I answer that really quickly? Can we just think about briefly? Just a note to here, we're not Registration number A, no, UA3886. You've left your lights on. Oh, that's me. Oh, still on when you go. <laughs> Should we let him go? <laughs> so, yeah, well, what was the question again? Our uh, question was about rezoning on the basis. So, okay, the rezoning. So, I think the idea is if someone came up to us and said, look, now we've got this geotech data, we can't build a foundation on this property with an area-wide fix and we would have to look at that. But I guess, you know, we'd be surprised to happen. But I mean, if that's what happened, if the GTX came back and said, that's what this information says, then we'd have to look at that. But the reality is that in terms of, you know, it's not a, it's not a secret process. All, those, all that drilling information is going to end up on a database, a huge computer program that any sort of engineering professional will be able to go into and see that information. So if you're results look like this and your neighbours look like this and there's some other result next door. All that information goes on a public database. It's all actually public information so they can understand what that information, what your ground is under your house and your neighbour's house and so on. So the insurers keep on saying it's uneconomical to do it after they get the results of the drill. Well, yeah, I mean, we can talk about that, Brian, but I mean, my, 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 my is Brian, eh? Sorry, yeah. sorry Brian. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, Brian, Brian Dunn, <laughs> this is Brian. Um, I mean, if insurance is going to say it's uneconomic to rebuild, you know, I'd like to know what's in your policy. Most people policies actually require the insurance company, if you've got a replacement policy, to rebuild on that bit of land. It's your choice whether they rebuild or not. And if, the land, if your house has to be slightly higher because of some, you know, another inch of flood risk, they also have to take that into account. So they may be saying, actually, we want to give you a big lump of cash instead, but my advice is don't take the cash unless you've got a solid contract with a builder to build something else so you know how you're going to move on. But so, if you've got to pay a mortgage so, on another piece of land... I, I, I understand those sort of trade-offs here. Yeah. Should, 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 should you pay us out of the land and we move on? Yeah. Well, you're on that bit of the land, Sorry, Brian, you say the insurance company says it's too dear for, to insure, who actually pays the land to be brought up to standard? EQC, owner, or is it the insurance company? Now this is okay. a question I okay. asked to EQC at one stage, yep. and I asked them, they insured the land, eight metres around the building. I agree. How deep do they insure it for and where they pay out for that? So this is I've got an answer, but nothing was faxed back to me on paper. Okay. So this is a question about the land and the land insurance and how it operates. Okay, so what, what does EQC cover and what does it mean? Okay, so the EQC Act when it comes to land, you're quite right, it's not your entire section. So you, you guys all know that? It's not your entire section? Okay, it, the Act is designed to basically ensure what I would call the footprint of your house. So where, if you cast a shadow across your section of where your house is, then we would take that shadow and go eight metres out and there's um, 60 metres of access way and a couple of other bits and pieces in there as well, uh, pertinent structures and so on. But let's just call, talk about the footprint of your house. Okay? And it, it ensures against physical loss or damage. And that's how it's defined in the Act, physical loss or damage. We've got to go through the process of understanding what damage is. Now, some of you guys have got damage. I mean, it's absolutely clear you've got damage, right? You've got cracks, you've got springs, you've got slumps, you've got undulations, you've got lateral spread, you've got liquefaction, you've I got... I just interrupt you. I went to the meeting on Monday and it was Bruce. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Mm -hmm. And was, I've got issues in my house, but obviously I've got to wait till things thing. But uh, So I'm getting onto the land yeah. claims. Every section, basically, that's more or less by that map, TC1 and TC2 has had a large level of land that has 
dropped. Any land that is dropped, you're entitled to a land claim. Where the only thing is you have to lodge. This is Dave's wording. Dave's. Everybody or groups, every everybody is entitled to a land claim. The key thing is you've got to lodge a land claim. Wow. And can your land claim be apportioned like everything else? Yep, it is. Um, no, it can't, unfortunately. Yeah. He said, basically, sorry to take over EQC, but so I think... That's okay, you're more than welcome to take me over. Come on. But as I said, I've asked to have gone into this, and there are, the EQC has two ways to do it. They either repair the land or they make a payment out. Um, he has said basically every property will be paid out. They won't be looking to repair it. And when you're talking about repairing, you're talking about Avondale has basically dropped on average 550 mils. So you can imagine if they decided to repair the land, you can one section being raised up 550 mil with soil on it, and the next door neighbour who hasn't lodged a land claim not been raised up, it would create problems with water runoff and various things from there. So basically every property is going to be paid out there. Um, one of the questions I'm going to ask later, but I'll bring it up now, is how do you work out what that payment is? Um, originally EQC on their website had a formula for land claims on how it was worked out and paid out. Surprisingly, that has now been taken off their website, <laughs> and the payment under Bruce's Bruce again, yeah. under Bruce's instruction, or Bruce okay. said uh, it will be the cost that it would cost to repair that place. Now, obviously, people that haven't got foundation problems, does that cost actually include lifting their garage and rebuilding? Well, what are you looking at? 100, 200 cubic metres of soil on your property? I, I can't envisage how they're going to work out a price for that. Or maybe it doesn't include lifting that property. But the, the thing is, there was a set policy on how land claims were paid out and worked by EQC. Now everybody obviously pays EQC levy, yeah. so my understanding is that we've all entered into a contract with EQC, just like we've got a contract with the insurance. How can EQC change that policy on how they work out a formula for paying out land claims to now a new one where they're just going to pay out the cost to the wood to repair that place? It's a very good question and it's wrong. <laughs> so, no, no, no. So, and I mean this, I, I want to explain that, so I don't want to be harsh about that. Okay, we've got an act. Actually, you've got a legal obligation legal entitlement under our Act, okay? So there's no policy in terms of how we set, settle land, it's set out in the Act. Okay, so I'll go back to, if I can just that have a go. That was on your side. So I'm yeah. going to have a go at explaining that, yeah. okay? So the process that we go through, okay? So, and if I don't explain that well, wave at me or hiss or something like that and I'll have a crack at, at, at trying to answer it or I've missed, okay? So we've got the... Are you guys okay with me just waving my arms around? Can you sort of see me waving and mm. stuff? Okay. So we're going to look at the footprint of your house on your land. Now that can mean some, some weird things, right? So here's your land. Uh, yeah, if I put EQC's wallet up there, you can see it's empty. Um, <laughs> so so sometimes, sometimes that might be your section, right? You've got a big long section and your house is up here. And you're just going to have the eight metres around there. Okay? And sometimes, I think across Christchurch, there's uh, real estate, you'll be able to help me out here. There's about 26 different minimum lot sizes across the wards. Yeah, it spreads um, basically from not counting cross leases, it spreads at 450, yeah, was yeah. the usual minimum. Yep. And so it's going up from there, basically. So the Act mm. talks about paying out the lesser of yeah. the insured area of the land, uh, the insured value of the of the damaged land. So we start, I'll talk about how you settle a claim, right? And Barry, if you're there and I get it wrong, come out and smack me quickly. Okay, so we're gonna look at the eight meters around your land and we've got to figure out, like an insurer, what's the value of that? Okay, so Roger was talking before about uh, getting valuers in to talk about what was happening with land out west. Okay, we've had to get valuers in and say, okay, well, how do you value land in a dysfunctional market? Because you guys know, the market's all gummed up, or was temporarily gummed up in terms of sales. 
and there's temporary aberrations. So do we value it now or do we look back and, th and try and look through what was happening in September and just sort of, from my language, ignore what happened in the earthquake, just say whether or not... And so we've got valuers looking about what does that mean and has it happened elsewhere. So what's an example? Brisbane, they have floods every... Pick a figure under 10 years, right? And so they, they also have problems with how, how do you value the land at the time in a disaster. Um, Chile, other places that have been earthquakes, same sort of thing, you get a gummed up market, so how do you determine the value on that? So we're seeking advice from the Values Institute and so forth, how we can calculate the value of that land, the insured portion. Then we look at what's the damage to the land. So you remember, um, and, and we're, well, it's in my slides, but I'm just going to ignore the slides and just talk, and if I get it wrong, you guys just yell at me, okay? So we're gonna, we would have had some of the land damage teams out there going across properties and mapping out what they saw. So observational data. What did I see as a trained geotech? And then there's going to be some of the other investigatory stuff. What, what's under the ground looking like? So if you look at the Stage 3 report, for example, that's got a bit of that detail in there in terms of how the land looks now underground. You take that mapping or that, that view from the geotechs and the guys have been out looking at, at your land. Here's what we saw across the section. Then you put the insured bit, the insured portion of the section over that. So we're only looking at the damage in that, import, in that insured portion. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Then I'm an insurer. Okay. So the analogy I've tried to use, and I, if I get it wrong, help me out with a different one. I'm, it's probably the wrong analogy to use. I'm going to talk about your land as a car. Okay. Sometimes you would have dinged your car. I know I have. Not your car, my car, dinged. Um, and my insurer might say, actually, it's worthwhile replacing the panel on that. It's, you know, 500 bucks or whatever to put the panel on. Sometimes I might have, in my youth, I'm a Timaru boy, so yes, I have rolled a car. Um, um, and the insurer might say, well, the car's worth five grand, the damage is worth four, eight, I'm going to pay out it at the insured value. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. We're going to look at the damage to your land and we're going to say, okay, what's the repair methodology here? How much does it cost to repair? And then I'm going to look at... There's three things in the Act, and I can't remember off the, off the top of my head, but it's the lesser of uh, minimum lot size applicable in the area. Help me out here. Uh, well, but again, that's the line yeah. the lines yeah. I was, but yeah. as I said, it's been taken off. The still top. there. I can guarantee I have not changed the law. But it's off your site now. Well, it's still in legislation. If you go to legislation.govt.nz, look up Earthquake Commission Act 1993, go to Section 19, bang, there. And I tell you now, it's pretty boring stuff as well. So, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you've got sleep problems. If I can add something else, is, is, sure. it oh. is, it is still, everybody can still lodge a land claim provided they've already got a claim lodged for their house. Or Actually, even, even better than that, if you've lodged a contents claim or a dwelling claim, we're going to assume that you have notified us of damage and you've lodged a land claim. Okay. okay. With, with my one, yep. I actually sent um, the geotech report in with it. So, can I talk to you about your one after this? Because is it is it okay if I if I talk to him about his specific claim can, later? Can I suggest should we should try? It's quarter past seven. Should we try and get through the presentations? Because for some people that are sorry, in the back, sorry. they want to. Should yeah. we get through all the presentations? We won't take any questions. We get to the end, and then we. For people who feel they've actually had enough of standing around in a hot room, they can go, and then we can carry on with the questions. Is that okay? Can I suggest yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. At the end? Do you want to talk at the end? Um, there may need some windows open on the other side. Because I, I do want to make sure that you hear well, from everybody else. I understand where Roger's coming, but seeing I've been on this thing. Well, I, I agree with Roger. I think we should listen to this yeah, guy. Yeah, I agree with this guy here. So this is Sarah meeting. So this, so I, okay, this is Sarah meeting. Okay, so what we're going to do is, because I'm, I'm in charge, I'm going to ask the consensus. Do we want to actually go through the presentations without questions? Or do we want to have yes. Yes. Okay. Who wants to stop and have questions as we go? No. no. I'm here or not. Okay, there we go. So let's carry on. Okay, thank you. This is sort of a, trying to explain what I was talking about before in terms of the, the area-wide drilling program. So the little uh, triangles there are the CPTs that might be pushed. The little blue things are the boreholes. So you'll see on this one, and I'm not sure what suburb it refers to, we're not doing every house. So we're trying to 
spread it out to try and do that interpretive data in between. Now, what that will mean is we're going to take, or your insurer, depending on whether you're over cap or under cap and who's managing your repairs, if it's a re foundation repair, is going to have to go and get a building consent, right? So Roger said uh, the building guy is your friend. The consent guy at the Christchurch City Council, I'm going to adopt. Okay, I'm going to send him Christmas presents, going to get him around for tea. I'm going to name my children after him or her. So if I've got boys, it's going to be problematic for them if, if her name's Judy or something like that. Because it's, it's them saying, actually, this data is sufficient for me to issue a consent on that uh, foundation design. So what happens with the data is it goes to a geotech. The geotech do their witchcraft. It goes to a, a structural engineer. They do their warlock craft. It's all black magic from my perspective, how they take the geotechnical and turn it into a design. Then somebody takes that to the city council or your local, it might be WIMAC, it might be Selwyn, and says, I want a building consent for that. And they look at the data there and say, yeah, that's sufficient for me to feel comfortable in issuing the building consent. What's going on? This is basically what you should expect to see. Um, the first one looks a little bit like a... I was going to say an ice cream truck, yeah. Um, but those are some of the rigs. Okay, so first of all, they're going to mark out the site. As I was saying before, there's no way we want our guys to push a, push a drill through a bloody pipe anywhere or a sewer or anything, okay? So do you want me to talk through this? Do you want me to just keep going? Go? Okay. Basically, if these guys turn up, please say yes, come on the property. Here's what it looks like. Okay, the one on the left looks like an ECG. I think that's the CPT output. The one on the right is your borehole stuff. That's what it looks like. That's what's going to sit up on the geotech website. It's what the geotechs and the engineers are going to use to interpret it. If you can interpret that, great, I'll hire you. Okay, because I sure as hell can't. So it, it's, it's there. It's going to be sitting on the website and it's available uh, on the geotechnical website. It's available to geotechs and to other building professionals to download that and get on with designs and so forth. Okay, um, the land damage assessment stuff that I was waving my hands around before is completely separate. This is about your foundations, right? Um, the land damage assessments look at observed land damage, so what we've seen. Now, some of the byproduct of this might be understanding how far under the ground land has changed and so forth. But in our view, we are looking, as the gentleman was saying before, we are looking to cash settle land claims wherever we can. Most of the damage, and it may not be here, but certainly out west, is stuff that, that I think your local rugby team is probably going to get a little bit of a, a bonanza in sort of doing the work. Some of it's filling in cracks, some of it's rake and roll sort of stuff. Okay? Some of the other stuff we're still, honestly, nutting through. What is the form of damage and what's the best repair technique? We've started emailing out what we're calling land damage information packs. That's basically, you're going to get a letter from us. It's going to say, here's what the land damage obligations are. Here, in terms of how our act works, sorry, it's a wrong waffly way of saying, here's how we're looking at, at settling your claim. There's going to be a picture of your land, sketches from the, from the team who have been out there. It's not necessarily going to give you, okay, here's the shadow of the footprint of your land, and here's the calculation in terms of repair methodology. It's a starting point to say, here's the damage we've seen. Okay? That's, that's already going out and it's still coming out in terms of rolling out those letters and those packs. The stage three report that's on our website, the one that came out uh, earlier, a couple of months ago, a month ago, looks at, at the land changes across Canterbury as a whole. And on the back of that report, there's a uh, suburb specific report that talks about the changes to the land in that <coughs> suburb. That will also form part of that land pack that, we, that we're sending out to you or posting out to you. Okay, then we've got to go through the process of exactly as I was waving my hands before, okay, what's the insured area and what's the repair strategy? And what's the costing of that? <coughs> Portionment and settlement, okay? Let's all hiss. Apportionment and settlement. Why the hell are you doing it? Okay? The beginning of 2000, oh, 2010, you've got the September quake. Okay, we thought our act was you've got $100,000 of dwelling cover for the life of your insurance policy, and most policies are annual. So, you know, when you sign up, you usually renew on an annual basis. Okay, that was challenged. So after the February quake, it was challenged, and we went to the High Court, and the High Court said, no, nah, no, nah, it's $100,000 per event. Okay, so per event, per, per damaging event. First $100,000 of loss to your dwelling, first $20,000 of loss to your contents, and then the land. Okay? Now, like you, 
we pay an excess on our insurance. So you know, when people talk about reinsurers, you know, this sort of faceless mob from overseas who, who are basically paying, pick a figure here, Roger, $13 billion or something for this. On our program, we've got about 52 different reinsurers. And they ca some of them are on the program for September and February. Some of them were off the program for February. So we've got, because we renew annually as well, we've got some who are up for different events. The declaratory judgment was basically saying $100,000 per event. That was fine, but as you guys know worse than I do, there's been just bucket loads of events, right? We've, we've got about 16 that we would call damage-causing events. We have to, because of the declaratory judgment which says it's $100,000 per event, because of our reinsurance contracts, we have to say, to the best that we can, which event caused what damage. Okay? And it's, it's for all of you who are under cap, under $100,000 clear, and you know that you're under $100,000, and we know you're under $100,000, shouldn't make a blind job of difference to you. It's a backroom accounting thing that I'm doing to say this is a bit of money to this reinsurer, this bit of money to this reinsurer. Shouldn't make a blind jot of difference to the flow of your claim. Should be getting on with repairs. We've done 21,600, so that's like fixing all of Nelson, I think. So we are repairing houses, it's not slowing it down. I think a question was asked, it's probably likely to be asked again today, I've only got one claim, so do I have to be a portion? Yeah, but it's not gonna make any difference to your claim, right, if you're under cap. On the overcap stuff, we've been working with the insurers, because I've got an interest in this as well, because it's about, ultimately, for anybody who's overcap, the apportionment matter, the apportionment result matters in terms of who might end up repairing your house, and ultimately whether or not you get a check from EQC for the residual. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're working with these guys, and at the moment it's, it is a frustratingly manual process. We've got to take in all of the geotechnical data. We've got to look at your claims. We've got to look at all of the other, um, you guys know all about LIDAR and that sort of palaver? So, do you remember, have you heard the term LIDAR? Yeah. Yeah? So, so you're telling me to speed up there saying slow down. I'll, I'll try and talk fast and slow at the same time. Um, so that's, you know, flying the radar to see whether the land, lands come up or down. So we're gathering all of that technical and scientific information, all the information from you guys. And then we're looking at, okay, well, what's the pattern of damage in some areas? So your neighbours and you should have a similar pattern of damage, right? Some cases you won't have. There's going to be an aberration that pops out. And we're going to have to look at that. And we're doing that manually. Now, at the moment, we've passed over... John, give me a figure here. I think at least 9,000 where we say we have apportioned and settled. Insurer, we think it's yours. There's about another three or 4,000 that we apportioned. I don't think we've got a settlement recommendation, but we've given to them anyhow, and they're going to come back. We've got at least one of the insurers saying, actually, 90% of this we're absolutely fine with. Okay, so it's the, it's the 10% that we're not. And it's about, okay, is it an aberration? Will you, because some of you will know, and I've seen it as well, sometimes there's a house, all the ones around it, to use the phrase, munted, and the house there, pretty good. So sometimes that 10% might be that aberration. Okay? All I'm doing is making sure that it's a backroom thing, I'm slicing it up for my reinsurers. All you're getting from, from me is just frustration, I know. So it's slowing things down. We're trying to get to a point where we can have a, a, um, what I would call a, a statistical one, where basically I can say to the reinsurers, we've got enough of these claims, we've looked at them in detail, that we can just push a button and get a distribution of damage across the properties. Are you comfortable with that? In that case, we can autom automate it and go. But I reckon we'll have these things done. We're doing, John, we're giving you guys about 900 to 1,000 a week, I think. We've got a team. Just, that's all they do. You should, I mean, they're drawn haggard and sort of strange looking, but that's all they do. Okay. We're looking to have everything done, all of the apportionment done, by May 2013. Jo uh, Roger gate crashed a meeting this morning, which was the insurers giving me a kicking, saying, look, some of the ones that are around about 80K, around about a good threshold, where if we did some drilling, they might overcap, can you give them to us? So we've got to figure out if we can, we, we can do that and they'll accept them, but we're trying to say, let's just push on and get these things over so you know who's dealing with your claim. Okay? Now, if it's us and you don't want us, and I know lots of you don't, Okay, there's opt out as well. Okay. So is anybody sitting on their hands tossing coins about what caused what damage? No, they're working their bloody asses off, quite frankly, trying to gather up all the information so that we can be as confident as we can. Okay? And some of it is, is you guys saying actually, well, I've got some evidence that showed that this, this event caused this damage. Okay? And you've already given that to us through some of your claims behaviour because you've lodged claims for stuff. Now at the moment, I'm getting good, reasonable good confidence from some of the insurers that, yeah, we're happy with the outcome of that. 
there's always going to be, be disputes. You know that because you're involved in them. You're caught in the middle, actually. And we know that as well. So we've been working with these guys today in particular, and Roger Gate crashed it, um, thinking about, okay, well, how can we ungum those in a way that makes sense for you? And what makes sense for you is getting us out of the way, I suspect. You're getting us EQC out of the way is, is, I guess, more to the point. So this I'm putting at every public meeting, okay? We're going to go and try and do the vulnerable. And, and vulnerable is a, an odd type phrase, right? The needy, the, the, the ones that, the, the cases that you know about, your friends, your neighbours, your relatives, who should be at the f top of the queue. Okay, we're going to try and get those ones done first in terms of the drilling stuff if they've got foundation damage. Remember, not everybody in TC3 is going to require drilling. We've got about a third where there's no foundation damage. We've got a third where the consenting authority, the local council, is saying, look, if it's less than 25%, you're not going to need that from us. Land claims. We're sending out those packs, so you'll be getting that. And, and by all means, crash our website in terms of downloading or looking at your own uh, uh, suburb-wide one that's appended to the Stage 3 report. We come up with sort of gloriously great marketable names for reports, so this one's called <coughs> Stage 3. Settlement. We're going to be apportioning or cash settling. We've given you some uh, timelines for apportionment. By May 2013, we want to have everything done. It's all the overcaps gone. Okay. Are we sitting on cash? We've got 3.2 billion that we've paid out. This is an average of $5 million a day since September the 5th, 2010. Okay, so am I sitting with my hands on your money somewhere? No. Okay, we're pumping it out. We're going to try and have all of the homes, if we can get all the insurers joined up on a joint drilling program, it'll optimise it, it'll go faster. Okay, and we think, uh, John, by March 2014, if everybody's, if everybody's pulling together, Yep, March 2014. If we get more rigs, probably be faster. Okay. If we don't have to do section by section, probably be faster. If the consenting authority says to us, I'm fine with two boreholes per, per sample, probably be faster. Okay. We're doing a pilot out in... Uh, oh, where is it? Horswell, sorry, Horswell. One of the things we're finding out there at the moment is, is people are saying, oh, I wouldn't mind if you drilled all my property. We ended up drilling about 14 holes where we thought we only needed to drill two. So it might come back to your question before about, was well, there an aberration in the land you have to do a few more? It, that might mean it slows it down in some areas, but it might mean it speeds it up in others. It just depends on what's under the ground, basically. And I don't know what's under the ground yet. Uh, Canterbury Home Repair Program, Bruce will hammer this with you guys, and I don't mean that in a sort of building pun, but hammer this away with you guys all the time. We've got a commitment. Okay, over 50 k's into next year. Yeah. Sorry? I'm getting whispery. I think I'm being told to hurry up. So we've got a commitment in terms of our commitment to our customers, the ones that we're managing the repair. Okay, the insurers are beginning to come out with theirs as well. Um, okay, I think I've bored everyone now, haven't I? Okay. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Okay, I'm happy to stay here. slight change of plans because we've been spending a lot of time on individual questions. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go through to the end of the speakers and then have our question time. If you've got pen and paper to write down your questions as you go, it will help a lot. I know a lot of you have already got your questions prepared and that's really neat. So I'm going to hand over to John McSweeney from Southern Response. Thank you, Linda. We're all set. Now, I'm just, uh, I am John McSweeney from Southern Response. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, insurers tonight. Um, just appreciate that there are approximately uh, 10 or more insurers in Canterbury operating, each is a separate standalone company, and uh, by all accounts, there are approximately 100 different policy wordings out there that are covering your homes. So that's why I'm speaking on behalf. It's not for any in individual customer or any individual company. Um, the insurers also recognise that TC3 is not a hazard designation on the land. All it means is that before a, 
new house can be built, a geotechnical analysis on the land or underneath the land has to be done so that the appropriate foundation design can be uh, provided for that type of house that's going to be built. The uh, first one is uh, overcap assessments. Now your insurance company is responsible for repair or rebuild when an, uh, an EQC payment of more than $100,000 plus GST for one event has occurred. So if an overcap for one event has occurred, then your insurer will be responsible for the repair or rebuild of your house. Um, the, just be aware also that uh, your private insurer is responsible for the uh, for the uh, items that are not covered by EQC, such as drives, paths and fences. They're not covered by EQC, they're covered by your private insurer, whether you have an overcap claim or not. Um, the, the, all the different insurers have had a different program for how the assessments uh, of damage have been done and uh, a number have completed all their assessments, some have not, but there is urgency being given to those assessments and it's expected. Most insurers expect that all their assessments for their overcap claims will be completed by the end of this year, that is before Christmas. <coughs> the timing for repairs and rebuilds. Um, this is, a, this is a difficult area. There, uh, it has been a little slower than we would like, but it is um, progressing now. We've uh, got the EQC land reports are coming out, the flood data has been given to insurers. That is helping, and it's not as bad as perhaps we may have thought, so that's not going to be uh, any particular hold-up. And uh, the drilling program is helping to uh, do the analysis of the land so that those foundation designs can be undertaken by insurers. Uh, in addition to any other drilling that EQC is doing, most insurers are running their own separate what's called an infill drilling program and that is also providing information to allow those customers that were uh, ready to um, identify the sort of uh, land that's under their, under their property and an appropriate foundation design can be uh, provided for the, for the type of house that is intended to be built. The current and ongoing insurance in the green zone is certainly an issue that has come to the insurance industry from the community boards as a major concern. Um, all the major insurers are committed to remaining in Canterbury uh, there is, as you may know, a restriction on new customers coming in. But if you're an existing insurer, an existing customer of an existing insurer, you are being looked after. And if you are rebuilding or repairing or having your house repaired through your insurer's project management company, then you will get insurance at the end of it. Um, for in, in virtually all cases, um, particularly if the uh, design of the new house is um, suitable but managed by your insurer through your um, project management company. You do need to be aware that insurance is an annual contract and, and the contract can be changed on renewal. We've all seen premiums increase already for uh, predominantly reinsurance costs and the increased risk uh, as well that is now evident throughout New Zealand. So these in premium increases haven't been limited just to Canterbury. They are occurring New Zealand wide. Um, there will uh, likely to be uh, further premium increases. There could be excess changes. And one of the sorts of things that there could be a greater excess, say, for driveway damage. Uh, and that is also intended to keep premiums at the most affordable level. There may also be some changes to the sort of policies that are offered. And uh, one of the things that we've been extremely fortunate with in New Zealand, virtually the only country in the world that has got uh, what is called an open-ended replacement policy. Now, that is not going to be able to continue. So our replacement policies will end up being what's called capped at a level 
and that will uh, mean that that will be the maximum that would be paid for the rebuild of a house. So if you have to have your house rebuilt currently, it's something to keep in the back of your mind that if you build a what's what might be described as a friendly design, which is of a lighter weight construction, uh, a stronger type of construction, which Malcolm will talk about is a rectangular type sort of house rather than a, an odd shaped one, they're stronger and they perform better. So you will be protected, your resale will be better, and your insurance would more likely to be more affordable for you and for a future purchaser. The uh, area-wide drilling program has been, has been covered. Um, insurers are committed to that because it has advantages effectly, uh, in effect for speed throughout Canterbury. Uh, but again, individual insurers are also doing uh, their own uh, drilling. But if uh, an insurer is doing a drill to do uh, to identify the ground for a foundation design for an individual property, they've got to do uh, just that one property. Uh, the advantage of the area-wide drilling program is that a greater number can be done in a shorter space of time and that uh, information is pooled so that it's available to uh, all of the insurers together. Uh, and just to reaffirm for the area-wide drilling program, it's the geotechnical engineers that design the program and design the intensity for where that, uh, those drill holes uh, need to go. And uh, it's, as, as has been mentioned, it's not the insurers themselves, it's not the bureaucrats, it's the technical people that understand the land the land, and understand the results that they're getting from the drill holes that have already been done. Um, deed of assignment. There are, um, there are two types of, of deed of assignment that you, need to, be, that you uh, need to be aware of. One is if you are buying a property or selling your property and it's got a claim on it that has not been settled, you need to talk with your insurer uh, or if you're going to be a purchaser, you need to be aware of what your entitlement would be when you buy or sell a property, what happens to that claim and how that claim will be settled So, going forward. So you do need to talk to your insurer because there are some limitations on it. You would uh, suggest that you get legal advice on it as well because in some cases what might potentially be um, thought of as a repair at the moment if that turns out that the house needs to re be rebuilt, your insurer may not pay that cost. So you need to be aware of that and check with your insurer and get legal advice if you're buying or selling a property. The other sort of deed of, ass deed of assignment that uh, some insurers have been uh, providing is that you've heard about apportionment with EQC. It is taking a long time. It's taking longer than we would expect, but some insurers are uh, in effect funding what the apportionment may be from EQC so that your claim can be settled. And this is particularly for customers that are purchasing another house and um, wanting to build on another site or are in a position to build on the same site already. So that's the other sort of assignment that some insurers are doing. They're effectively funding for you what EQC is going to what, what we expect EQC is going to pay a little bit further down the track. The cash settlement option, the uh, settlement options, uh, most of the insurance policies in Canterbury are replacement policies. There are some others and there are some market value ones, but most are replacement. And what that means is that your policy will cover, uh, if you're over the $100,000 for one cap, your house will be repaired. Um, the other options are to have a house, if it's over, if it needs to be rebuilt, your house can be rebuilt on the same site. You do also have a choice to rebuild on another site if you wish to, and if you've got another site, but you have to supply it. And um, the other option is to take the value of what it would cost to rebuild your house on your existing site, uh, to take that amount of cash to purchase another property. And most insurers offer that. There is no policy that offers an automatic right just to take the cash money for the rebuild and go and do whatever you want. Um, if 
you wanted to do something like that, you would have to have a special negotiation with your insurer, but it's not, and it's not uh, available to you as of right. The only uh, option for, uh, as of right, for cash, is what is called a market value settlement, which is assessing what the value of your house was prior to the loss, prior to the earthquake events, and uh, depreciating that house, and then you entitled to that amount of money in cash. It is significantly less in most cases than the actual rebuilding cost. And uh, finally, uh, you will hear people talk about um, the process that you've got to go through. You've got to get maybe a building consent, might be a resource management act consent, plans have to be drawn up, all these other things that need to be done. If you're working with your insurer through their program management uh, office, uh, they will do that for you. You won't have to go to the council. You'll see the councilman come to inspect your um, building as it's being uh, built, but you don't have to lodge all those applications or pay for them uh, or prepare them. Your insurer and the project management office will prepare that for you. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Look, conscious you've been sitting here for an hour and a half or more and um, many of you will be getting tired and want to get away. Others will want to ask, stay and ask questions. I'll try and whip through my slides very quickly in 10 or so minutes so that um, we can crack on with questions and, and free others up who need to get away. Uh, look, I'm, my name's Malcolm. I'm from Building and Housing. Building and Housing is a government uh, agency who regulate the building and construction sector in New Zealand and we set the standards for the quality uh, that buildings, including houses, need to meet. So we write the building code and maintain that. Uh, we set the uh, technical categories and as Roger mentioned, it really was a triaging exercise. There absolutely is a scarce resource of geotechnical and uh, structural engineers in New Zealand and we knew that uh, there were different um, degrees of land and building uh, damage in, across Christchurch and varying degrees of sort of soil conditions and we knew that there were many areas that wouldn't need to have geotech and structural engineers uh, applied to them and others that do. So through that triaging approach we were able to um, free up um, houses in the uh, TC1 and TC2 areas, about 80% of our residential housing stock to carry on and progress through their insurance process and get repairs done and focus our geotech and structural engineers on the area where they'd be most valuable. So um, geo technical categories are, are not uh, anything more complicated than guidance around the level of technical investigation geotech investigation necessary to look at the land and then some technical guidance on some foundation solutions. They're not a hazard map, they're not a zoning and we're really trying to debunk some of the uh, misunderstandings and myths around that uh, because that's created a little bit of stigma, some of it um, you know, perceived and some of it actual. Uh, geotech, uh, and we do have um, a geotech engineer here tonight, so when we do get into questions, we've got a geotech guy here who can answer some of those questions and will be available afterwards as well. So, so why did we come up with um, TC3? Well, I've sort of talked about that in terms of the triaging approach, but what was the criteria? Um, it, it, it involved area-wide geotechnical assessments. So for more than about a, a year and a half, there's been an area-wide geotechnical assessments being undertaken in Christchurch, and through some of those earlier geotech assessments, we were able to um, categorise the land. We also looked at the observed damage to buildings and the observed damage to land as well. So those sort of three criteria and factors helped us determine the technical categories. And as uh, many have spoken about, for some of those houses with, with foundation damage and TC3, further information is necessary. And, and EQC are running that program, as are some of the insurers, in terms of infill. And really it's just, just about building houses um, to suit the ground conditions and building them right and, and building them once. Um, geotechnical investigations and engineered design foundations are not new in New Zealand. This is business as usual for much of the construction industry all over New Zealand. Uh, we appreciate it's new to Christchurch on the, on the flat area, uh, but it's very common across New Zealand. 
Um, in Auckland, much of South Auckland has expansive clays and to build a residential house in South Auckland you need a geotech engineer and you need the, uh, and a structural engineer to design the foundations and find out what the ground conditions are. <clears throat> Parts of the Port Hills, most of the Port Hills in, in Christchurch have always needed geotech engineers and structural engineers uh, and areas that are prone to peat and, and marshland areas or have always need geotech assessments. So this is business as usual, it's, it's tried and true and tested sort of building practice across New Zealand. Uh, we've developed a lot of technical solutions, lots of guidance documents, um, pretty dry reading, it's all technical stuff for engineers, uh, but available on our, on our website for those who are interested. And there are technical solutions that we've developed um, both for repairs and, and for um, new build foundations. Some of you may be familiar with some testing work that we did out at QE2 Park, uh, where we, um, we designed and built some uh, new foundation solutions and then we tested them and we simulated earthquakes to see how they would perform and then we actually had the December 23 um, earthquake and so that gave it a real shake up and tested and so that's been part of our testing solution to come out and provide you with um, solutions that will work. And it's really about building buildings in future that are far more resilient to um, future earthquakes should we have any of those. Um, an, an issue that's been talked about a, a little bit recently is the, the weight of buildings and the types of claddings that can be more resilient in future earthquakes. And the simple, the simple fact is the lighter your building, the, the, the less uh, robust your foundation, or the, the less sort of um, extra strong your foundations have to be, and uh, the better they perform on less than desirable land, which some of you have. So we're encouraging people to think about lighter weight building uh, materials, lighter weight cladding, and lighter weight roofing. Um, a, a typical 150 square metre home, um, uh, timber weatherboard, um, corrugated iron roof, uh, three bedroom standard home might weigh around 20 tonne. The same thing uh, with brick veneer and concrete tile roof might weigh around 60 tonne. So the, the type of claddings that you have can make a big difference on then the type of foundations you need to have, the cost of those, and then how well that building will perform in future in a significant earthquake. So do think about in your insurers and their project management officers are likely to be having conversations with some of you around thinking about different uh, replacing your building cladding materials if they're doing rebuilds or repairs and, and you know getting rid of some of the concrete tile roofs and brick veneers that have uh, not performed as well. And uh, some people think that this stuff's inferior or cheap and we're really trying to debunk some of those concerns. Look, um, lightweight claddings can be um, absolutely um, durable and fit for purpose and, and pretty looking. So in terms of the actual technical foundation solutions, we've come up with sort of three that we've tested and tried and we're really confident are going to be the most resilient we can have in this part of the, um, the country and the ground conditions. Deep piles, site, ground improvements and surface structures. Uh, we've developed a lot of guidance and sort of technical solutions and criteria and formula. Engineers need to find out what the ground conditions are, interpret that with our guidance and then actually design a foundation. So whilst we've got three sort of types, it's not an off-the-shelf solution. You do need to have the engineers to kind of apply that information. And we'll jump into some of the little um, designs here. So if, for those that can make out the picture, <coughs> this is deep piles. Tried and true um, building uh, uh, practice in New Zealand. Uh, pretty simple concept here. Really, you, you drill piles down until you find nice, firm, um, and solid bearing ground. And for some of the houses in TC3 areas, they have a thin crust. The crust is the term that we use to describe the top layer of earth that can usually um, take the load of foundations and we put building foundations in. And then they may have a layer underneath of, of prone, liquefiable um, soil or land, earth. And so these piles have to get down past all of that until they find nice, <coughs> solid bearing ground. And so they can be quite deep on occasions. But this is a good solution for houses that are complex in nature or they have heavyweight claddings and, and, and the likes because they can super strong can take a lot of those um, heavier weight claddings. Not necessarily um, uh, desirable or suitable around areas prone to lateral spread because that's the land moving horizontally um, under, underground and, and piles will take a lot of pressure and strain on them. So, so good in some situations and not in others. Just some more pictures there. <coughs> This one here, this is a, a ground improvement solution. This is really about, um, in simple terms, scraping uh, the, the area on the site, un the building platform under where the house will go, uh, and uh, remediating that land, putting compacted hard fill back in underneath that building platform, sometimes injecting it with cement and making it pretty strong and robust, and then being able to build 
um, a sort of a normal foundation and house on top of that. Not, not so um, common in residential construction because it's quite complex, um, but, but well tried and true in a lot of um, civil engineering uh, situations. So this is quite common when they build highways and rail bridges and the likes, where they remediate the land underneath and then build something on top of it. Uh, this will be quite a good solution around areas prone to, um, to liquefaction lateral spread. This is another solution, again uh, a good solution for areas prone to lateral spread. It's really about staying shallow on top of the land. This is uh, about um, uh, timber piles, which many of your older houses have, and we've got some solutions here as well with concrete. And uh, what we do here is, re this is this is a sort of a raft solution. The concrete slab stays fairly shallow, it sits uh, across the land, and uh, it can kind of ride out the future earthquakes should we have any significant ones. Um, may slump or get out of alignment but can be easily re-leveled, connected back up to any services that might have um, popped out like your sewer and stormwater and be up and running and be habitable again very quickly. So that's another solution um, for areas. It's really about keeping the house foundations shallow and sitting on top of the land. <coughs> and that's me in terms of some of those. I guess I just had a couple of little comments I wanted to cover off. There was a question around floor levels and um, some changes that we made to floor level requirements a little while back. Um, a lot of misunderstanding around that. We've got a little fact sheet at the back for those of you who are interested in that that explains some of that. But yes, we made some changes to the floor level requirements, uh, but the levels that you can have are almost um, insurmountable and certainly normally not um, visual to the human eye, so it's very, still very, very shallow. And as a human, you'd hardly notice the, the, the degree of slope that you can have on a floor now. Um, so. Uh, that's explained a lot better than I can do right here and now on a fact sheet that we've got lots of at the back of the room. So for those who are interested in some of those new requirements, <coughs> do grab one of those fact sheets. We've got a whole lot of fact sheets just around these new foundation requirements, so please um, grab those. And then there was a question down here, I think, around sand and building houses on sand. Look, sand's actually one of the easiest um, um, soil types to build on because it's quite predictable. Hundreds of thousands of houses built on sand around New Zealand. Most of the, the seafront and beachfront properties around New Zealand are built on old sand dunes and a lot of sand underneath it. Um, it's actually quite a, um, a, quite a good um, ground uh, condition to build on because it's predictable and we know how sand behaves. So that's me. I'll be available after for questions. Hi, um, my name's Chris Vandenbosch. I'm the Engineering Services Manager for the uh, City Council Building Operations Unit. We, um, I'm the building consent guy, if you like. <laughs> um, you want to come to my place for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll see. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I don't do the inspections uh, very often, um, so I can't take up some of those offers. <laughs> I'm going to uh, sort of breeze through the uh, presentation. I'll just talk to the, what's on the PowerPoint. I had a, a, a longer um, presentation, but we've been here a long time. And I think some of it, uh, many of you have been to some of the other meetings I've seen, so um, it's, it's probably well known to you already. Uh, we, the, the Council, since the uh, September earthquake, September 2010, has been working to um, increase our, our resource and our, our capacity to uh, process uh, what we're expecting and is occurring, a, an increased number of building consents. Uh, we've worked um, with industry to find out what the uh, Sierra with uh, the DBH, um, with the PMOs, uh, everybody to try and find out what our uh, future demand might be um, and then to figure out how we can meet that demand. Um, one of the things we've been uh, looking at doing is trying to make sh sure that our process is run uh, smoothly. Uh, we're, we're talking about, you know, just in the, in the, the first year when the, the major um, uh, rebuilding starts, and it's just starting to kick off now, uh, probably about twice uh, as many consents as we would normally handle in any one year. And uh, that's over the next, um, I think Malcolm was saying earlier that over the next three years or so that's going to um, probably get up to about three or four times. It's uh, you know, quite astonishing numbers. So a lot of it is about uh, fine tuning. Uh, we've uh, looked at ways that we can um, 
remove ourselves from uh, you know some of the processes, and I think um, there's been some reference to that here, where there's you know uh, things that are now exempt that perhaps weren't in the future, in the past. Um, so in the future that we don't get involved. Uh, so. Now this is uh, obviously very topical around this area, um, the uh, flood management areas, FMAs. Council has, this is not part of what I do f for a living, I mean I have people in my team who understand these things a lot better than I do, um, but my involvement is mostly with the, uh, the, the likes of the building consent type processes. But I do know that you know um, the council has been working on these flood management areas for uh, uh, you know some years now, and accumulating a lot of data. Uh, they uh, brought out variation what we knew as variation 48 uh, in 2003. Um, that was uh, made operative uh, 31st of January last year, um, and the areas concerned are uh, the Styx River uh, lower uh, reaches. Uh, the Avon and Heathcote Rivers, uh, Lansdowne Valley and some of the low-lying uh, coastal areas including Redcliffs and Sumner. Summer. Um, I've got a couple of uh, questions that have already been posted to me uh, that I can address, you know, answer at the end of the presentation, so just bear with. Uh, there's been questions about uh, land information memorandas. Um, Basically, the council's obligated uh, to provide on land information memorandums and project information memorandums any information that comes into our possession about uh, particular properties, even if the property owner might uh, see it as potentially detrimental. Um, so, if you're you know thinking about um, buying a house, for instance. Uh, you would want to know everything that you possibly could about that property and that's what the uh, council's uh, LIM reports will provide for you. Uh, so I guess in terms of um, uh, the uh, technical categories that's uh, uh, and the land zoning, um, that's all uh, public information. If you can go and get a, onto a website and, and type in your address and it'll tell you what your uh, technical category and your land zone is. Uh, that information is available to us, so um, clearly that's on the LIM reports. Um, yeah, so that pretty much uh, summarised that, I guess. That's and the final thing that I've been asked to address is uh, rates for mission. I have absolutely no idea how they work out rates and <laughs> how they manage that process, but in effect what they've said is that 40% uh, um, rates for mission uh, where properties are unable to be occupied. Um, I did actually have one of those. Um, the, uh, we must remember that rates are for more than uh, water, rubbish you know, collection and, and sewer. Uh, there's all the other uh, city services that um, the city council provides uh, which we still um, <coughs> take advantage of. You know, things like the libraries and the uh, various service centres, all that, are, you know, in the, um, the public transport system which uh, council has an interest in. All those things are things that your rates uh, pay for. Now I mentioned that there was a, a couple of questions. I think that's the last one. That's Sarah, so. There's uh, some questions that, that have been posted about, and I think I heard some of these at the session I was at on uh, Monday. Uh, what is the council's position on the rebuild repair of foundations on properties if there is no evidence that land levels have stabilised and or if it is now on a property considered flood prone? I think it's, uh, unless your property is close to uh, a waterway, it's unlikely, unless there's uh, future significant events, that it's actually uh, dropping in, in level, or rising level for that matter. <coughs> um, and I don't think that uh, it's correct to say the council should have a position on that. Um, basically, if, if uh, from my perspective, as you know, uh, handling building consents. If uh, somebody comes to me with you know, a set of documents because they want to build a, a building on some land, uh, I just want to find out you know, is that land able to be built on? And uh, that's where we get the geotech information from, uh, you know, from the geotech engineers. Uh, we get the structural engineers involved to you know, provide a design, do the two marry. 
um, those are the things that we assess. So in, in, in my very simple space, if, um, if the building design fits the land, then you'll get a consent. That's, uh, that's quite simple. Now, I realise that there are some planning issues that might um, be around that, and some of the questions that were asked uh, you know, at the previous meetings were around the planning. Um, I'm not a planner, so I can't give you a huge amount of advice there, but what I can say is that you know, where the, um, for instance, if you're on an FA, F FMA, and uh, the uh, floor, the minimum floor level that you've got to build to now, to um, uh, because of the uh, understood um, potential for flooding, uh, it might raise your um, overall house further out of the uh, out of the ground. Uh, that could affect your recession planes. Um, that could affect uh, the privacy aspects of um, of your siting. Uh, so those things may require you to uh, obtain resource consent. Uh, another question here, what if anything will be recorded on the uh, property reports with regard to land level change and or being classified as a flood prone property? Well, um, I, I don't think we're actually recording anything about land level change because that's, um, well, it is available and when you uh, apply for a, a limb if there's any information that we can about give you about the uh, the land level we will do that um, and the same with the project information re memoranda if you're applying for a building consent we will give you uh, you know things like the levels of the drains and, and those sorts of things um, in your locality if, if it's uh, available um, and of course I've already discussed about the uh, land um, classifications Uh, if a property is classified as flood prone, uh, what makes it fall into this category? Well, um, that's a uh, that's a, a complex question to answer. Um, but in essence, what what it means is if uh, you know we live on a, a relatively low lying um, patch of land, uh, we have uh, some significant waterways running through this land. Um, we also a coastal region. So all these things have an influence on um, uh, how we're affected by water. Not only that, we have, uh, particularly on the eastern uh, fringes of the city, we have uh, a very high uh, water table. Um, and some of you might appreciate that the, uh, the um, pressure on that water, um, the, uh, the artesian pressure on that water in the Eastern suburbs is actually positive, so you can actually, you can actually have um, wells that are that are self-driving. Um, it, it goes it heads the other direction out the other side of the of the city. So there are all those things influence um, how uh, a an area could become flood prone. And essentially, what we're uh, doing now is mapping, or have been mapping for years, um, how, how far those uh, areas uh, can flood too and that's what that um, uh, the, the flood ma management uh, area is about so that's it for me